Welcome back, everybody, to Confluence World Podcast with Brian Rector. And folks, it's hard to believe that now we've reached the end of the school year at Michigan State and a few different other colleges we were able to connect with, such as Grand Canyon and Seattle Pacific University. And um, now that the year is over, we've been in a little bit of a hiatus. I've been working at a golf course and kind of carrying on and, and uh, enjoying. But folks, what we have been doing behind the scenes is trying to work on how the podcast will look going forward because we've been so blessed and fortunate and I personally am thankful from bottom of my heart to say that we were able to, during the course of the school year, host 22 different guests including five Big Ten champions, which was phenomenal and something that I feel like a, a lot of work on behalf of the kingdom was done. And a lot of messages were shared. A lot of points were received and conversed and debated upon. And I truly, truly could not have imagined it going any better than it did. So with that, I am so overjoyed, and honestly, I was largely overwhelmed the last few weeks with the understanding that today, folks, on what is May 27th, we get to host a two-time, Lord willing, soon to be three-time, Olympian who competes for Great Britain. And Cindy, now is exactly the time that I want to bring you in and, and would love if you could introduce yourself from the standpoint that you become a renowned track athlete at the University of Michigan, which I thought was an interesting point, being that you and I are you know, going to school or had gone to school versus are going to school in the same state and our uh, arch nemesis. But with that being said, I came across your content. Uh, related to faith and related to how you have chosen to further the kingdom and share the gospel within your circles of the track and field domain and the Olympic domain. And I was just so inspired and blown away. And I had, I know I reposted a story of yours that was one of the uh, kind of the influential pieces you had done about, I think it was, if I can remember, it was. Um, Verses that are, uh, you know, uh, worth remembering while going through a, a racing season, I think it was. But with that being said, I just wanted to say before we get going, thank you for being here. And tell us a little bit about where you are right now, what you're up to, being that Paris is, is in the fold the next couple months, and then uh, we'll start from there. Yeah, excuse me, for sure. So first and foremost, I just want to say I'm so excited to be on here because I love what you're doing and I love this podcast because you guys are doing some really helpful stuff for the kingdom. So I'm really happy to hear that you guys are making progress with it. So that's really cool. But my name is Cindy. I am a, as he said, an Olympian. I've been to two Olympic Games. I went to the University of Michigan. I graduated in 2016. So I've been out for about eight years now. I've been running professionally ever since. And in that time, I've always been a Christian, but I think that time of my life within my professional career really propelled my faith. I think God used a really difficult time during an injury, like early on in my professional career, to kind of bring me back to him. As I grew up, I was, I've always followed him. I've always been of the faith. I grew up Catholic, still I am Catholic to this day. And um, the Lord kind of just allowed some turmoil to kind of happen to kind of say, hey, like, yes, you've been a Christian, but you haven't actually been doing you know, which I think you can be doing it, which is actually being intentional with your faith and living it out and trusting me and all that good stuff. So I think my career has helped me to do that. And the more and more I continue to grow in it, I just feel very called to share it with other people because I think this is such a life changing thing. And I think everybody can, you know, benefit from following the Lord and especially athletes. I mean, it's really easy to make it so self focused. And that's something I had, I kind of struggled with at the beginning. And I think once I started incorporating more of my faith into it, that's when things started to change. And I continuously seen God work in so many different ways. And I'm still going through, you know, times and trials and whatnot, but now I know I have the Lord to truly help me through them. So uh, yeah, that's just been kind of a little bit quick, I guess, intro of my testimony. Um, and yeah, I'm just really excited to continue to share the gospel through what I'm doing. Thank you so much for sharing. 
And I know there are certainly many points within what you just said that we'll, we'll dive into at a deeper level. But where I wanted to begin, Cindy, was the idea, as we'd mentioned, that it is true that Paris is coming up. And so I was wondering, I know that you were just in Eugene, Oregon, which I found so interesting, and especially the, the timing of how things are going, because I'm actually originally from Portland, Oregon. I'm from Wilson, just about 20 miles south of, of Portland. Yeah, so yeah. when I uh, saw that, I was like, oh, my gosh, wow, the timing couldn't be better because now right. I, can, I can say that uh, and share that with you. But I know that the Prefontaine Classic is one that is serving as kind of preliminary um, tune up, so to say, for, for mm -hmm. getting ready for Paris. And in that, the question that I really want to start with and jump off with is how has this training cycle been and what are some of the, the things that you've seen in your game right now and um, what are you looking for in uh, the next small window of time really before making the trip overseas yeah so the training cycle has been really really good i started training for this olympic games i mean as you guys may know you train for four years right so every four years you just start a whole new cycle but i would say every ever since probably this September, October-ish is when I really started getting prepared for it. So I started off really well. I had actually come off of a knee issue last year. And so it wasn't my best season. And so I took it, I shut it down a little earlier and kind of like went into the off season, worked on some stuff with rehab and just got some treatment that really made a huge difference in how I was able to run. And so doing that, shutting my season down and then preparing for this new season really made a huge difference. And now I truly feel like I'm the strongest I've ever been. I feel really, really quick. I'm really making, I'm making leaps and bounds. Like I tie my personal best in the indoor season. And now I'm close to my personal best in the outdoor season. I've only had a few races so far. And so I'm really excited. I definitely feel confident. Um, last year was a struggle. Like I did not run times that I was capable of. I was really just searching just to kind of get back on my groove and I couldn't do that. And so this year I've surpassed those times and even my bad races are still surpassing those times. And so it's just really cool to see just in the mount in 12 months, how much of a difference things can happen. And I think honestly that it's the grace of God that made that happen for me because he kind of directed me as to what I needed to do last season to prepare for this one. So things are going really well. I'm super excited. I have a, I have a couple more championships and meets before I go to the like the British champs. So um, I actually have my British champs in a month from now, and I have the European championships in two weeks, and I have just like one or two, maybe like one more tune up race before the Olympics. God willing, I, I qualify. So that's how it's going, and I'm actually really excited about the season. That sounds just phenomenal and also like really hard to manage as you're continuing yeah. to move through and be traveling and and navigating the environment that is trying to qualify and mm -hmm. um enduring the the um rugged really is kind of the word that i couldn't get out of my head um stretch of racing and training and rehab and yeah. such one thing that um i noticed because lately i've been following your times and your travels more closely than before uh, mm -hmm. just by nature of, of being prepared for the show is that and i was i was captivated by um i think it was a a post um that you had curated on on instagram mm -hmm. which essentially said just that that your fitness is as good as it has been and that's something you're really excited about but one thing that may have been missing in Eugene was the the um, execution, really. It's yeah. kind of what it came down to. Mm -hmm. And so I was wondering in that is like, what is the the margin of error between having a race that you're feeling good about versus one that you're not so much? What are some of the the details and the things you look for that go into your assessment of how it goes? Yeah, that's a great question. So in my event, I run the 100 meter hurdles. And as you may know, or if you guys don't know, it's like a 12 second race. So if you run 12 seconds, you're probably happy. If you run over that, like 13 or 14, you're not, you're not probably happy at my level. <laughs> so my goal is always to run faster than 13 seconds. But um, the margin of error is very, very like small. So if you make one mistake, like for instance, I did not have a good reaction to the start gun. And so I didn't get out. And so that really affected literally half of my race, because if you don't set it up from the beginning, you're kind of in a, you know, you're kind of behind and you can't catch up tip because everybody's so quick. And so I actually ran a time, one of my slowest times of the season because of that. And like my personal best could have potentially won the race, like stuff like that, where it's like, if I just 
executed what I know I'm capable of, I can do a lot better. It's just a matter of it happening on that day. And so that's one of the things, like you can be in the best shape of your life, but if it doesn't happen that day, it just doesn't happen. And I've had, I've had instances where I was ranked number one going into a, a meet and I hit a hurdle or I fell or something crazy happened where, you know, that just wasn't my time. And I've also had other meets where I was ranked last and nobody expected me to do anything. And I somehow put it together and I won. So it really is just about what that day holds in the sport. And it's a good thing, but it's also a very nerve wracking thing. So that's why I had to really lean in on God's, you know, help in that because it's only so much I can do, right? I can prepare, I can be ready, I can mentally do everything, but at the end of the day, he has the full control as to how it goes. And I'm just trusting that. And so that's what I've kind of come to terms with is like, I'm going to do my part. I'm going to put in all the work and I'm going to allow God to do the rest. And, you know, every meet leading up into the Olympics is going to be a test for that. And I'm going to keep working on what I need to do. And if that's, that race doesn't go well, at least I know how I can fix it the next time. So that's kind of what I learn as I continue going through this process. Mm, that makes sense to me. And I think um, one of the things that I take away immediately is that you have done this sort of, of cycle before. And in fact, a couple of times. And so in that, I was wondering if you could spell out maybe how it's been different than the previous couple and um, even, and I, I don't want to, uh, you know, how do I want to say this? I, I don't want to assume your response, but I would love to hear from your perspective is what is the scope of, of where your career is at in terms of this is your third cycle? Like, mm -hmm. uh, is, you know, is three it? Is there another one coming? Like, in terms of where your career has come from and, and where it's going, uh, is there, there, you know, like bunches of years to look forward to? Uh, and that that should be a short answer, like yes or no, I would yeah. presume. But but also is um, compared to the first couple cycles, of how uh, has it gone? Yeah, so my first cycle was Rio 2016, and that was like the first year I came out of college, graduated that year. I was still new, so no professional experience at all. I mean, I had went to like a world championships in 2015 that year before, but wasn't proper professional experience. And so mm. kind of went out, went in there with like a, you know, like a dare in, in, in headlights, like not really knowing what to expect, very nervous, very kind of just scared and, you know, just didn't have quite the confidence that I should have had going into it. Um, and so I just, when I went to that first Olympics, I knew one, I had run some of the fastest times in the world in college. So I was ranked pretty well actually, but I still didn't know. Like I'm like, well, these are going to be girls who are like 10 years older than me. And I don't know how to you know, feel about that. So it was definitely, as you can imagine, hard some, for somebody so young going to their first Olympics. I made my team at 21. And so it was, it was difficult, but I decided like right before I entered it to just say, okay, you're still young. You still have a couple cycles to go. Just go out there, have fun. There's no pressure. I had to tell myself that and, you know, like pray about it. Um, but at that time, it was, I was still really relying heavily on my own skills and own stuff. I wasn't really, I was praying, but I wasn't truly trusting God with it because I was still young and inexperienced. And so went to the Olympic Games and actually surprised myself. I, I made the final, which was my first goal. And I was like, cool, like I made the final. This is really hard to do. And I'm like, anything can happen now. And then I actually finished fourth, which I, which is almost a medal. So I was like, I did not expect to do this. Like it was really cool. But at the same time, it was very sweet being two one hundredths of a second except for my medal because it was very close mm. between the third place. And so it was like, it kind of put some fuel in my, my, my fire. Like I was like, okay, I know I can actually run with the best. So let me train get some stuff together and hopefully come in the next cycle and actually get the medal that I really want. So the confidence came, then also some of the problems came as well. So literally that following year when I was so excited, I was like, okay, I feel confident. I'm excited. Uh, I got, I ruptured my Achilles tendon. And so that cycle threw me off like that. Cause you, as you guys probably know that the Achilles is literally a big part of the body that takes like years, like to actually come back to feel good again. So people tell, told me, that I might not actually ever come back from it. And so it was really hard to hear because I had just signed a contract and I was just ready to start my professional life. And this happened literally one year later from that. So very difficult. Um, and I didn't get back to myself until about, I would say 2018, 2019, probably more mm. 2019. It took me a long time. And so um, that was really, really hard, but that was the biggest time that I think the, that the Lord used my faith to really develop. And so he gave me so much strength, so much grace, so much just I had just sat down with him and just said, Lord, I don't know what to do. I'm very confused. I don't understand 
And that's when he said, like, I need you to use this season of not having track to grow your faith with me. And like, actually, in that season, he said, like, no, you're going to come back to track. Like, I have faith. Like, you made me have the faith that I'll come back and I'm going to probably come back stronger. Like, I had a lot of revelation, but I didn't, in that moment, I didn't feel that. So I had to really rely on that. And with a plenty of like, you know, therapy and uh, just rehab and everything, I did come back, but it was also the prayers I think that helped and just his, his own strength coming through me. And so I was able to come back. Um, I actually went to the world championships in, 20, in 2019, made it to the semifinal, which was good after what had happened. Um, and then the following year I was ready to go to Tokyo. It got canceled. That was a little sad, but they pushed it a year, which I thought actually could help me and put me in a better position to get more training and to kind of get over that injury. And so 2021 was actually probably the best actual season of my life. I actually started improving again. I set personal best. That's the first time I've seen personal bests after that injury. I was running literally so fast. I got so strong and everything just felt like it was going super well. And then right before the Olympics, it just felt like I had some like training mishaps and some stuff. It wasn't injury or anything related, but it was just kind of like coming back from working with my coaches and trying to figure out what was going on. I didn't really know what was happening. So right beforehand, I just felt very flat. And so I went to the, the Olympics ranked well, but just didn't have a good performance. And so that was really difficult, especially after having such a good showing in Rio. I was like, I'm literally five years older. I'm more experienced. I feel strong. Like, why didn't it come together? And that was also another season that I had a lot of lessons from the Lord as well. So it was just a lot. And so for it to be the, those two cycles, knowing all of that I learned, now going into my third, I have so many lessons and so many things of you know, maybe I did the wrong things right before I competed and I didn't get enough sleep the night before because people were in the village speaking too loud. And there's a lot of factors that I, I learned from it where I'm like, okay, going into my third one, God willing, I have these things I know I can fix. And there's just so many years behind me now that I'm like, I got this. Like, I, I really, truly can do this if I, if I am so fortunate to attend again. So um, yeah, that's kind of the whole cycle. And, and to answer your other questions, I have no idea. Um, after this year, we'll see. Uh, usually athletes tend to start tapping out in their 30s, and I'm going to be 30 this year. And so um, I'm going to go through this Olympic cycle, and then we'll kind of like reevaluate. But at the moment, like we're going to just like really go hard for Paris and hopefully do it well. That's kind of the goal. Absolutely. And I appreciate um, the answer on that back half of the question. I did not, once again, did not mean to say, you know, how much more is left. None of that. Uh, but just to, to understand um, the scope and the space and time of where it is, because yeah. I think you, you said something very important, which is that there is a threshold, right? There is a, a certain time where it becomes more difficult uh, yes. to, to keep climbing the mountain, so to say. Uh, but what were some of the when during those trying times? Because now that you, you spoke it and, and I heard and received uh, the message that you shared, Mm -hmm. What were some of the, the learnings that you had and, and what were some of the, maybe the verses or the uh, principles from the word that you turned to specifically, if you can remember back to those most trying and um, darkest days, so to say. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so Jeremiah 29, 11 has always been one that I used to put it on every single like prayer board that I had in my house, like my apartment. And it was truly just like God has, as you guys may know, before I don't have, the, before I didn't have the plans, I know for, I'm butchering this, I'm sorry, <laughs> for, I'm going to have you say it if you know it, because I'm literally messing up every single word of it. But when Jeremiah 29, 11 is literally the Lord's plans and he has a plan for us and he's going to work it all out. And that's kind of where I just truly remembered every time I would feel those feelings again. And um, it just really helped during that time because I knew that even in my weakness, the Lord's strength is so much better than mine and so much stronger. And I knew that relying on him was all I could do. Like there was times where I really just wanted to get back running and I wanted to, you know, just prove myself to be good and all this stuff. And I literally couldn't, like I was in a boot and I just felt so useless. I'm just like, I don't even know what to do right now, God. And he's just like reminding me of my faith, reminding me of my identity. Like that, that's a big part is like, I'm not just an athlete. So that I had to learn that too. Um, and then also another verse was, uh, I think it's Psalm 31, but it's God is within her. She will not fail. And that's just like a reminder for me that I can't, I cannot fail when I have the Holy Spirit living within me. Like failure really isn't a thing. And so when I was going through those times of like, oh, but I'm not doing this. So I must be a failure. I'm not, I'm not doing that properly. That just reminded me of like, no, everything is happening for a purpose with a purpose. And I just need to trust that. And so, yeah, I think those are the biggest things. It's just like, 
really relying on that time. I spent a lot, a lot more time in the church. I used to go pray a lot more. Um, I would like go to chapels and just like spend time in my word and praying and just literally asking the Lord to just speak to me and give me any type of like hope just so I didn't feel so just dis- dis- depressed in a sense, because I truly had placed so much of my identity in college and track. Like when things started going really, really well for me, I was, you know, getting accolades. I was winning all the titles I had prayed for. Everything was happening. I started just becoming the athlete. Like literally every time somebody acknowledged me, it was, oh, she's the really good athlete. And so you start to associate that with this who you are. And I was like, okay, well, that's what people know me as. So I might as well, you know, remind remind myself that who's who I am. And so I struggled with kind of once that was removed to truly know who I was. And so during that time, I had to really like kind of reshift my mindset. And honestly, it's a it's an everyday thing because it truly can become easy to get right, get back into that. Like I have times now that sometimes my husband even has to remind me, like, you know, even if I have a bad performance, that's not, that doesn't define me. Like I can get really sad and be like, dang, like I really feel like I disappointed everybody who watched and it's like, that's not what it's, this is about. So um, yeah, I have to continuously ask the Lord for help. It's never just like I've arrived type of thing, but I have definitely, I've gotten the tools now to know what I need to do when I get in those moments. Mm, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think um, one of the things that I've heard, and of course the, the platform that I have for now is mm-hmm. being in the collegiate space and the most direct contact is with collegiate athletes. Um, uh, but one of the things that I've heard is, and maybe one of the questions that have been posed is when is it that um, my identity will be begin to separate? Like what what does it take to to do that, to try and draw out the understanding that I am not just what I do? And actually, um, Joshua Langford, who was on my show, who played basketball at Michigan State um, a few years ago, he mentioned, mm-hmm. which I thought was so important, he, he said, one of the things that I really struggled with was he went through an injury bug a lot like you were describing. And he said to me, which kind of just rocked me inside, but he said, uh, when I stop doing good things and the good things he was referring to were scoring points in a basketball or doing things that uh, on the court that will help Michigan State win. He said, when I stop doing good things, what will everyone around me who's ingesting uh, me through this vessel of what I do, what will they see? And Mm -hmm. I thought that was such a poignant question to ask. Uh, And that was something that that really resonated. with. But I think that's important for me to mention to you, because when is it that track started for you? I know that oftentimes it's something that can come into the equation very early. And mm-hmm. in some cases it, it comes in late, but I'm so curious to know, when did you recognize that like, yes, track was going to be my endeavor. I was going to chase it. It was going to be for me. Yeah, that's a great question because that's like another God thing. So um, I actually started when I was like about 14, the so freshman year of college or high school, excuse me. Um, and I was like, let me just try this thing out. My sister had ran track before me and I, I didn't really want to follow in her footsteps. I wanted to be like a basketball girl or a volleyball girl for the two sports I enjoyed really. And so when I started track, it was more of like, I'm just going to do it for conditioning. I'll be, let's just see how it goes. And so I tried it out and I kid you not, like I was struggling. Like it was not easy. <laughs> I like would not be, I couldn't do some of the drills. I just would get last at practice. I started having shin splints quickly. It was just really rough. And so I remember being like, and even my like, I would have races. I started having races in my freshman year and it was just not going well. I was getting like dead last. And I'm like, mm, this might be for me. I don't like this. I, I just didn't like the feeling of losing. I'm just very competitive ever since I was a young child. <laughs> And so I was like, I think I'm just going to quit because I don't want to do it anyways. And so I quit. And then like two days later, my high school coach calls me and says, hey, like, where are you? And I'm like, I'm done. I'm not running. Thank you. But bye. And then she's like, uh, actually, no, I think you should come back. I see a lot of potential. You have you have some like, you're rough around the edges, but I think you can work with something here. Like she literally saw so much potential. And I didn't, I didn't understand why she was saying that. I'm like, I've been so bad. Like, how do you even see any of this in me? And so I asked my, I talked to my family, I prayed about it and I was like, okay, let me just try this out again. And I came back and it wasn't like this, like, oh, the next day was perfect. Like I still struggled, but it, I would say about maybe a couple months in, I started seeing glimmers of hope with it. 
And I was like, oh, okay. Like I can actually do this drill once things start to click and I can actually like get over a hurdle pretty quickly. And, you know, I started doing these things and then eventually it's just like, that's when it felt like it happened overnight, even though it was a slow process. It was just like, it just makes sense in my head. And like, I started training better. I actually won my first race. And then like, it was just like uphill from there. And so I would say that when I came back, this was my sophomore year is when things started taking off. And then by my senior year, I had started like winning like state titles, or, like, like just titles. Like I was winning like a whole bunch of like high school meets and I got to a point where I went run regionals one state and then like I started getting college offers. And so I would say I was a very late bloomer. Typically kids start to, they start their first, like they start even in like middle school sometimes. And then it ends up being something they know by their 15, they're 15 and like they're, they're good. Like they know where they're going to college at that point. But for me, it was literally like maybe two weeks before graduation that I knew what college I was going to. So it truly was the Lord. If she had never said anything like this girl needs to come back, like I would never be here today, like running as, a, as an Olympian, because I just thought like, if things don't work out when you start, you just end it. You know, that was not my mindset. And so just to all the athletes out there, just don't just quit if it ends up being bad, like the first few weeks, like there, time might actually help you. And so that's kind of what the Lord showed me in that season is just because something's not working out. You I like, he's got my back. So that definitely made a difference. Mm, yeah. Oh my gosh. So let's put a pin right there because I would love to, I have one question, but then I would like to jump into um, more of the, the college career as we keep moving forward um, mm -hmm. through, like we had talked about early on. But yeah. my first question out of that is, is seeing that you've been in the track environment for longer than half of your life, which is, is I'm sure, something that you look back on and say, has it really been that you know amount of time with that many right. twists and turns to the journey? Right. But do you remember the Cindy Ophelia before track camp you know it's that's that's a good question because it's really difficult to think about that because there's been so much um just had to happen with the actual sport that like it reminds me of like the successes and all the all the good things all the bad things like all that's what I remember but now that I'm thinking about that because I don't I actually don't very often um I do. She's always been competitive. She's always been driven. Um, she loves to, to, to move. So I've always been athletic. Uh, but it was one of those things where like life was never that serious. I feel like I started making things super like I have to do this. I have to do that when I started track because I wanted so much success from it. And so, yes, I do remember it. But I feel like track has been, like we said, half of my life at this point that it, I have to actually like get into that part of my brain and think about it because I don't remember it very easily. <laughs> certainly. Certainly. You know, um, that to me, what you just said, uh, absolutely hit a nerve, uh, because I, I think it's it's super interesting to acknowledge how early uh, that some of these sports are are um, kind of captivating and the leaders of young athletes' lives. Mm -hmm. So in that, um, if you had to kind of synthesize to one or two pieces of advice for the young athlete who's discovering what they're going to pursue what's something that you would recommend I would say honestly try this is regarding to sports or just anything um in general try things out like don't be afraid to just experiment like my parents one thing I loved about what they did was they didn't just like say well your sister ran so you have to do that from like the age of five like they just wanted me to just try things out. I was also in the orchestra. I did, uh, I played the trombone. I, I've, I've done a whole bunch of different things. So it wasn't just like track has always been my whole life. And it also just opened me up to like life experiences that provided me the success I had in track. And so I would just say experiment like with all different types of things. Don't put yourself in a hole too early. And also I think that me starting later in life with track helped me not to feel so burned out, which is why I've been able to have such a long career. And mm. so, yeah, I would just give athletes that advice like, even if you do start at a young age, I'm not saying people, because there's been people who, who succeeded who started at like five, but if you do start at a young age, like don't put so much pressure on it and just have fun with other things because you have so much time to like make it like your job. Like when you, if you become a professional like me, like it's going to become a job at one point where you have to make money from it and you have to like, you know, it changes like the perspective a little bit. And so enjoy that time of just like being able to do everything and have fun and I think that's just like the biggest thing I would say because it becomes very serious at a point where it's like, okay, like I can still have fun, but this is a little bit different now. You know what I mean? So yeah, it's definitely something I would say when you're first starting out. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I really do like the way you said that. Actually, 
gosh, dang it. I just want to admit a lot of the things you've said have resonated and um, mm-hmm. been, been uh, shared, I, I think, uh, eloquently. So thank you. But sure. um, with that, how did it become that? Because I know originally you're from Ypsilanti, if I have mm-hmm. that correctly. How did it become that you were going to run for Big Blue? Oh, yeah. So when I was, I've always loved Michigan. So I used to go to meets for watching my sister. My bas- my brother actually played football in at the University of Michigan. So at the big house. So I would like go see that. And so it was really cool to be there. And then obviously it's 15 minutes from Ypsilanti. So I was like, this is really dope. Like, I like the idea of this. However, I am so competitive that like, I didn't want to be the little sister of my sister <laughs> when I went to the university. So I was like, I don't think I want to go there. Actually, it's really funny, but I was really considering going to Ohio State. And so I was just like almost about to sign papers, but then I went on my last official visit to Michigan. And I was like, there was like no denying that it was like the place I wanted to be. Cause like, I just loved my visit. I love the environment. The coach was really, really good to me. Um, it was so close to home, so I can go home when I wanted to, but it wasn't like right in the backyard. So it was just like, it made the most sense. And so that, I think once I decided to do that, it literally was the best decision. And it's such a good university for academics. So yeah, I mean, I and as much as I didn't want to initially, I think it worked out that I did go. And yeah, it just, it was all God's grace that I ended up at University of Michigan. Mm. You know, um, one of the things that intrigued me very early on was that you said that you've always had a background in faith and always been yeah. um, tied to to the word. So I think one of the things that I would love to to uh, ask about is as you made the jump to, to Ann Arbor and were competing at Michigan, what did your faith look like outwardly? And what was the culture like at Michigan? Because I know you just mentioned that coach was great and environment yeah. was great. What did those things look like? And did they allow you to be open and honest and uh, contribute to your development within your faith? Yeah, great question. Um, So I started, when I got to college, I obviously still went to church and I was really trying to still keep my faith. So I definitely didn't like go backwards in a sense. Like I wasn't like, let me just forget all about this thing that I grew up with. However, I definitely did not progress, I would say, because I kind of just got kind of sucked into that college lifestyle of, you know, just like doing what everybody else was doing and going out to parties and everything. Mm So looking back at it, I don't think I was living the life I am now in terms of like just doing the things that would reflect my faith. And I, I will say that I just didn't like just getting caught up in the college culture. I think college is amazing for people to go to, but sometimes it can get really worldly. And I think it's really easy to just be like, okay, well, everybody is doing that. Nobody's really talking about God. So I'm just going to, you know, not really talk about it. And so I think that was the biggest reason, like, as soon as I got out of it, God just like changed everything up for me with my injuries and just like not having, you know, just a different, like everything looked different in my life a year later when I graduated. And so looking back, I think I tried to keep the faith, but I could have done a better job. And so that's my advice to people who do go off to college and do like grow up in the faith. Like don't allow the college culture to get to you. Like, make sure you're still doing everything you did. Try to like get into godly community. Cause that's another thing I wish I had done. Um, I didn't like, I, I had AIA, which was athletes in action, which was really helpful, but I wasn't consistent with going and, you know, it just wasn't really aligning. So I think just being really intentional with finding friends, finding community, you know, being involved in church still. So if you do have time, which I know for athletes, it's hard, but if you can be involved in your church, do that, because I think it's really good to still find that community of the, of the church. And so, yeah, that's what I would say, something I would do differently if I could go back, but I am happy to have the lessons that I did, uh, I guess, coming out of it, because now I can look back and say, oh, I'm a changed person. The Lord has really worked through me, and I do think I've grown a lot more in my faith since then. Mm, Certainly, certainly. And I think, too, um, you know, I was taken aback as soon as you had mentioned the scheduling and the timing of everything being a collegiate athlete and working to figure it out uh, because there certainly, I would imagine is a significant transition period. Uh, Mm -hmm. But one of the things that uh, I wanted to mention and kind of give a shout out of my own um, is there were a a contingent of Michigan state athletes that were just at ultimate training, which I'm not sure if that existed uh, when you went to college at Michigan, but is that something you've heard of? The UTC. Oh, it sounds familiar. No, I don't know if I heard of it, though. Can you explain it a bit more? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So basically, uh, this year, I think there are two editions of Ultimate Training Camp, but it's a um, 
crew ministry slash AIA uh, sanctioned event where a contingent of athletes from around the country head to a disclosed location. Like the two this year were uh, Colorado State in Fort Collins and then uh, St. Thomas University in Minnesota. And so you're sent to a collegiate campus and you're together with something like, I think it was um, maybe 200 different athletes from around the country. And Mm -hmm. you just have time to be in the word and complete physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual challenges throughout the week and have times of prayer. It's a really great event that's happening. Uh, And it just finished actually at uh, Colorado State. That one just finished yesterday. So I wanted to go shout out and ask you about yeah, if yeah. that uh, was something. But yeah, I never heard of school. okay, yeah, yeah, that's super interesting. I wonder. I wonder. And something I'll research on is what was the development of that like, uh, and what year and and all that. But is there anything that is there any moment um, that you can remember from your time at AIA that was kind of foundational for you going forward? I just remember so many like older athletes coming in and talking to us and just giving us so many inspirational talks. I can't remember a specific one. I do remember one other track athlete guy who came in and spoke to us and he just shared his testimony and just like seeing how the Lord changed everything in his life really intrigued me. And I'm like, hmm, this looks really seems this seems really cool. Like obviously I I know I believe in God and I'm I've been raised to believe in God, but like nothing feels different. Like my life doesn't feel like anything's changed. Like I don't know. I just felt like people having these cool testimonies always kind of get maybe interested in like what made you get so close to him or like what's what's different and so that would be the biggest thing is just like hearing the old the older athletes come back and say like hey like faith this is huge like don't forget it like it's going to be a, a monumental thing in your life to like go moving forward and yes they were extremely right like nothing happened in my life to make me feel like like I needed not that I needed God obviously I've always known I needed him but like it just kind of felt like I was going through the motions of life and it was just like God was there in the background in a sense and so when I had to go through that time of like, oh my gosh, I don't know what else to do. Like that truly showed me like, oh, I see what they meant in that moment. Like I need him. Like I, I can't do this on my own or I'm going to go crazy. Like we, we really can't live this life. And it sucks that it has to get to that point for some people like myself, where maybe when you go through hard times, that's when you truly recognize it. But I just wish everybody could see that from the beginning, even if you don't have to go through anything. So now that I see that, like, I don't, even when I'm going through a good season of life, I'm like, I'm just less. I'm going to continue to de- just follow him because this could be taken away anytime. And at the end of the day, it's not even about this life. Like I need to remind myself of that too. Like it's about eternity with him. So um, yeah, that was the, that's the biggest thing is just hearing people come back and encourage me in that way. Mm, absolutely. I think um, if I could glean anything from that, it's about the importance of the support system. And I think especially to one support system that as I was kind of conducting my research is paramount to your career has been the support of your family, but namely your sister who you've run, Mm -hmm. as you said, not wanting to be in the shadow of, but now having competed against and been able to kind of be alongside throughout Mm -hmm. your journeys. So I would love if you could speak and, and shed light on what it's meant to have her as a guide and yeah. to be alongside her at some of the most, I mean, really the, the um, premier events and kind of the, the um, top stages of, of the sport. Yeah. So I've always looked up to my sister. Like she's amazing. She's done so many cool things. And um, when I was younger, I just wanted to be like her, even though I was like pretending like I didn't, like I deep down wanted to be like her. So um, it was it was really cool because we had our first big meet together in 2015. So that was my first world championships and first international meet period. And I was like one of her like towards the end ones, like she was, you know, getting towards the end of her career. And so it was it was really cool because we got to race together in that meet. I didn't run as well as I would have wanted, but she like went in as like one of the favorites and she did, she didn't do as well as she wanted either, but she still made the final and did well. But it was really cool to kind of like be in the stands and watch and support her and just be alongside her in that regard, but also seeing what she could do. And that encouraged me. So the following year, I'm like, okay, my sister made the final. I want to make the final too. Like I want to do something. And we also made the Olympic team together. Actually, we made two Olympics. Both of my Olympics were together, which was really cool. But uh, the first one was really, really nice because I was super nervous. And I just didn't feel, like I said, very experienced and didn't have the confidence. And I just remember like going in the back of the call room. Like this is where they call you up, getting ready to come outside to the field. And we literally just, we just sat there and we prayed together. And like, 
it was just a moment just really reminding me like, oh my gosh, I really do have my sister and we can just shed light on the fact that God is not in this for us. And it was cool if they got on TV too. So I have like this cool photo of us together, like in that moment. Um, and hopefully other people could somehow see or be encouraged by that. But yeah, so that was really, really cool. And it's just been really cool to run besides beside her and just have that experience. Um, eventually breaking some of her records was cool too. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> But uh, yeah, and then having the second Olympic experience with her in 2021 was just phenomenal because that was her last Olympics ever. And so uh, although that one did not go out to plan for both of us, um, we still had a really, really good experience. And it was fun to just like have the, the lead up and the trials and everything too. So yeah, I'm just really grateful to have had such a guide and have somebody I could always go back to and be like, hey, is this how things work in the sport? Or is this how management works for agents? And have those questions, but also have somebody camaraderie. Like we trained together, we had fun together. We would literally go experience different foods together. So it is really, really nice when you're an athlete to have camaraderie and just to have it as a sibling is even better, so. Mm, certainly, certainly. And I think too, um, one thing that just came to mind, actually, that is, I think, tremendously important to to discuss mm -hmm. is that you both run for the country of Britain, correct? Yeah. So how is it, because I know you both presumably are, are from Ypsilanti and yeah. uh, have, you know, worked your way up through the um, kind of American juniors and then collegially at, at Michigan. How mm -hmm. did it become that you would run for, for Great Britain? Yeah, so obviously my sister had time to do it before I did when she had started, but she um, kind of opened that path and like we both knew we had citizenship in Great Britain because my mom was born in London and then my dad was also born in Nigeria and then we were born in Michigan. So it's kind of like that three citizenship option. And so I think we were just like when it came down to once we wanted to be professionals at it, like what country would be the best support, what would make the most sense um you know just what country would we want to represent and when we did like the research and understanding and figuring it out she she birthed in Great Britain and obviously like when I saw how good of an experience it was for her I followed suit but I also just really am proud to represent Great Britain um it's been such a phenomenal experience they've done such a good job and making teams with the country has been fun so yeah just having that citizenship has been really a really dope experience and just opportunity for us and it opened up opened up opportunities for us that I think um, sets up for success. So it's it's mm. been a good experience for sure. Absolutely. What are some of the because this is something that that has been a question that honestly I've wanted to ask somebody somewhere for as long as I can remember. So I'm so fortunate that I get to ask you. Is what are some of the feelings and emotions that are associated with competing on behalf of the country? It is such a different feeling. I mean, it's really different when you're running just for yourself, like, you know, at meets, but like knowing you made a team that's backing you up, that's supporting you, that's giving you all this love. And there's a country of people like supporting you back home and just like watching everything and wanting to see you succeed. It brings an element of just, I guess, not pressure, because that's not really the word I'm looking for, but like uh, pride, like you want to do well for them because you want to show up and you want to wear that vest and truly show up and do well. So I think it brings like just a different level of like expectation, but it also brings different performance because I think every time I can put that on, I'm like, okay, I'm not just running for myself, I'm running for other people too. And it, it just, it makes it more enjoyable. And I think championships just open up another realm of, I don't even know, competitiveness for me personally, just because you have all those, those components, but you also have higher competition. And it's like, this is the time and the, everything you've been training for. So it, when it all comes together, it works out to be like that typically. And I, I just love that time of the year because I get to one, represent my country, and then two, hopefully put on a really good performance. Mm. There are two things that, that I would like to kind of steer off to. I noticed in your response that you steered away from the use of the word pressure. But I find that's interesting because it kind of is true that, as you yeah. noted, the entirety of a country is surveying you and watching what is happening and, and um, hoping that all goes well. And yeah. so I was curious, have there been any moments of time where you felt negativity and it's been hard to stomach the idea that uh, there might be rejection, at people might be displeased? Uh, because I know that's certainly something that we can relate back to biblically, being rejected and yeah. not being one of maybe an in-group. And so with that, um, the concept of competing on behalf of a, a national flag, um, have you felt that before? 
Yeah, there's been plenty of times. There's been times when I didn't compete the way I wanted to, and people negatively commented on things on social media. There's been things where, you know, being born in America made it a little bit of an issue. So, like, there's just been a lot of things where you've gotten some backlash. And so, um, you know, it definitely brings us challenges because if you're not really strong mentally or just even, like, spiritually, you can get really tested and it can really affect you. And so I think for me, when I first came out, I would pay attention to that stuff and be like, oh, they said these bad words about me. Like, what is this about? And, you know, it really affect me. But now I think with the whole faith thing getting more, becoming more of a component in my sport, it's made me just, I'm just like, okay, the people who are actually here and supporting us are going to be the the supporters. They're, gonna, they're not going to care if I don't have the best performance that day. So like, I'm not doing it for that. And at the end of the day, I'm running for an audience of one. I'm not trying to run for the, like for everybody else, I'm really running for the Lord and what the show of the gift has given me. And so having that perspective has released so much pressure of like, it, first of all, it's not in my hands, it's in the Lord's. And then two, I can't like just allow the, everybody's opinions to affect me. So it's it's easy to fall into that trap. But as I gotten older and experienced it, I haven't allowed it to like get to me. I'm just like, I'm going to go out there, do what I can do best and train for it. And then two, I just like to, or three, I like to treat it as like another track meet. Because I think that's also a problem sometimes. It's like we like to think of it as, oh my gosh, like, it's such a big, you know, big experience and big thing, but like the Olympics is still the same races that, you know, I've run at practice or I've done in a meet where nobody was there watching and I have to run myself. It's still the same 10 hurdles. It's still the same distance. Like it has not changed. And so it's like, I have to continuously put that in the forefront of my mind of you've been here before. You've done this many times. You've been doing it since you like literally been your teens. Like there's no need to like put amounts of pressure on yourself because once I do that, I'm not going to perform well typically. So yeah, mm. having that reminder and then also having like the knowledge that God is not does, doesn't actually care if I win a race. Like I want to win it, but in the grand scheme of thing, He's not going to be like, oh well, because you didn't win, I can't. You can't be a child of God anymore. You know what I mean? So yeah, that's something I have to keep keep in the forefront of mind. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And in that, uh, the last thing I really wanted to uh, discuss with you about the Olympics in particular is the type of connection that can be bonded and formed among the athletes in the Olympic Village and within under the same flag. I was wondering how your experience has been uh, through your first two and and, um, how kind of things have gone and what the experience has been like compared to the expectation of what people make the Olympics and the spectacle that it is out to be. Yeah, I mean, it is, it truly, it does live up to the hype. I'm not going to lie. Like, it really is amazing. You go and you see this village of just so many different sports, so many different athletes everywhere around the world. And you just, you almost get overwhelmed because it's like, oh my gosh, like, I'm not worthy of being here. Sometimes you just see people that, like, even me growing up, I remember like, my first Olympics, seeing athletes there that I used to look up to. Like, they were just there, like, in the village. Like, it's really cool. And, like, other athletes that, you know, I watched on TV, are just, like, really cool things that you see. And so just to be part of that and to be like one unit, you know, fighting for the same things. And even though it might be different sports or different events, we are here for a very common thing, which is the Olympic Games. And so I think just having that experience really was cool. Um, I, I'm, I'm an experienced or I haven't I've had an experience with something completely different, which is a COVID Olympics. <laughs> and so in 2021, that did not look like this 2016 Olympics. It was it was wild. Like, I mean, yes, the, there were still the amount of people there was still the village, but you had dividers at tables, couldn't sit six feet apart from anybody. People had masks on. You had to get tested every single day. It just was not the same experience. You're in and out. So they forced us to get there like two days before we competed. I mean, like in the village and you're out two days after. It's just like wild. I was like, this is not what I experienced in 2016. So I'm happy that that's not going to be the case in Paris because COVID definitely ruined things a little bit. But I would say overall, COVID aside, I think that made a huge, huge difference for, uh, or that just, having that experience has made me realize how big of a deal it really is. And it, like I said earlier, it lives up to what it, it is truly. That's wonderful, wonderful insight. And I think something that uh, I have been meaning to find a way to segue in, which I'm glad we're able to do it at this point, is have you been able to interact with others in the Olympic Village before about their faith? and about things that they believe and about their upbringing and the differences culturally, how has that been, that understanding and yeah. and those conversations? Yes. So in 2016, I remember going to like a little chapel with other believers and, you know, we would get together and pray before the races or competitions and some people would share their faith. And that was really cool to have like other chaplains there to kind of organize that. 
because there are so many believers who, you know, want to grow in their faith and just not like stray away from it just because of the Olympic Games, you know? And so to see that, just like be like, oh yeah, we're all one body, we're all a community here. It was really cool. 20, 2021, like I said earlier, did, did not have the same experience because we couldn't even like be in contact with people. They wouldn't even let chaplains in, I think, because of COVID. It was just unfortunate. And so, um, yes, I've had experience. It's, it's really nice that I've had two different experiences. So like 2021 wasn't my only experience. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I think there is opportunity for sharing your faith and just having others kind of resonate with you in that regard. Um, and I think this year I have more people who I know believe in the Lord and hopefully we can get together and actually do something. Cause I have a girl who does an event in my sport, um, who's actually like, like setting up Bible studies and she's like, Hey, whenever we get to meet, let's, let's all come together and hopefully we can make it like a larger thing. Cause it hasn't been that big. And there's, yeah, I think there's people who want to do it, but just like feel nervous about it. So hopefully we can make it like such a big thing that people can all do it. So. <laughs> wow. Oh my gosh. I feel like that's information that I'm privy to now that I almost shouldn't be. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Oh my goodness. It's, it's that really is, that's tremendous that there's something like that that's being planned. And, and I now have grounds to be prayerful over that. So yeah, I, I do because the enemy is trying to make these chaplains not able to come in for some reason. I'm not sure what's going on, but they're like, oh, we're having a hard time. And of course he's going to try his best to make this not happen. So please do pray. <laughs> yes, Absolutely. Absolutely. And I know that you're somebody who um, has certainly uh, what I would declare as a robust media presence in that you are very commonly posting and sharing thoughts and being outward with faith and who you are, personal life, many different things, many different avenues. I was wondering if, if you could speak on where that comes from. And uh, kind of how you got off the ground with content creation and um, what you are kind of aiming for when you're posting things of that sort. Yeah, that's a great question. So it's interesting because growing up, I actually hated speaking and I didn't like talking or sharing my opinion because one, um, I just never thought I had anything good to say. And I'm like, nobody really cares anyways. And then two, I just didn't like public speaking or I didn't like, I just feared that you know, I'll be judged or there's a whole bunch of the normal thoughts people have when they share their thoughts on things. So I never really wanted to do any of that. But I think 2016, towards the end of like my college career, I felt I felt a call to start doing content. And I'm like, I feel a call to do it, but I don't know what I need to, what I want to do it on. Like, I'm not really sure why I feel this calling. And then I didn't really start it because I was just like, I'm going to start something because I'm going to start it. And then I went through everything I went through and it was just like clear as day. Like the Lord's like, okay, I, I really want you to share this with other people because of what you're experiencing right now. And it wasn't even like, I was not, I wasn't even out the trenches. It's one of those things where it's not even like, I want to, sh I'm sharing good things. Like I'm, I'm sharing the hardship. I'm sharing the, the, you know, all the behind the scenes. And I think the reason he wanted me to do that when I prayed about it was because we tend to, sh I see every athlete, like I tend to follow, never really shares the behind the scenes. And it's always highlight reels. And people are looking at celebrities and athletes as like, just as people who don't ever have problems. And so I felt like when the, I went through that, it was like, I want you to show what it really looks like for a lot of people. Because I think more than, you see the 1%, but like inside that 1%, you see a lot more people that are struggling than we actually understand. And, you know, I, I really wanted to shed light on that because it's not as clear as it may seem on social media for most people. And so, yeah, that was a big thing for me is having that inspiration of, okay, I think people need to see what it looks like to really go through the hard times with athletes and share behind the scenes and share that, you know, you can go through it and still grow through it. Like you don't have to just be sit sitting stagnant and be sad all the time. And um, yeah, I think that was the biggest part. And as I progressed, I felt called to like kind of take it to different platforms. So I started with YouTube and I'm still going on YouTube um, not just with faith, but I also share just like food and a whole bunch of other stuff too. And then, um, on Instagram, I felt a call to just kind of like be more, like be more specific. Like I felt like I really want to share verses. I really want to share like, okay, if you're struggling with fear, here's what you should do. If you're struggling with this, this is what I do. Like I'm sharing what I've personally dealt with and what's actually helped me. And I think that's, this is where it comes from. It's just like, I went through this, I'm seeing a lot of fruit. I want other people to experience that too. So. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, I think. This um, kind of the recent changes that we've seen with NIL and with different avenues to be outward about it has led to just a complete change in trajectory of the opportunities that are out there. And I'm really like fascinated by the fact that to me, it seems like you were on the forefront a little bit of being in that environment. 
But mm-hmm. one of the things that that um, has troubled me as I've grown into the role of curating content and sharing messages and been um, interested in in um, talking about the word and about what I think related to it is breaking down the barrier between what is put on my heart versus what will obtain the most followers and the most Mm -hmm. likes and the most aiming for the numbers. So I was wondering if there's something that, um, if that is something you've thought about, and if so, uh, what have you kind of reasoned through relating to that fight of uh, the, the passion and the, um, the true like thoughts versus what will win and be successful online. Uh, yeah, that's a huge, I think that's such a big deal in content creation because it's a dopamine thing and it's social media at the end of the day. So it's very easy to get caught up in like, oh, wow, you got a lot of likes. Okay. And like, let me see what else I can post or, you know, it's easy to get a cough in that. Right. And so I went through a season last year where I just got to a point where I'm like, why am I doing like social media? Because I, I won, I was like, I had to like kind of reframe what my purpose was because I was getting a little bit caught up in it. It was really easy. Um, and I had to be like, okay, I'm gonna take a month off from this because I need some redirection. And I just felt like the Lord just kind of gave me that season of being like one, you're doing this to help people. Like, I mean, obviously I can share some of my experience and have fun with it too. So it's, it's still part of like what I do, but at the end of the day, don't worry about that. Like, I, if, if a piece of content is meant to be shared, shown, people are going to see it. And that's like, that's the vibe I started thinking of. Like, I'm not going to start chasing likes and numbers. And I honestly, when I went into it, I was like, okay, God, I'm going to share more and be more specific. But I started, I started feeling the spirit and the flesh start to get in the, in the way because it's not that popular. I'm going to be honest. Like, I used to feel like people don't actually want to hear about faith all the time. And so I'm like, I felt that. And I'm like, I, I don't know. And I'm like, I think that see that month I took off, I just remembered being like, who cares? Like, I need to just focus on what I want to share. If I feel called, if the Lord wants to show it to people, cool. So I literally just started creating content that I felt like the Holy Spirit was in, like sharing with me to share. Like, I was like, I'm going to pray about it. If this is what he wants me to say, cool. And sometimes I literally will pray right, like five minutes before I actually post anything because I, I just want the right eyes to see it. I'm like, whoever is truly in need of this right now, please place this video right in front of them. And I mean, like, in, right after that, like, break, I started seeing a lot of my content take off, and I didn't even expect to understand why. Like, literally, I've never had viral posts before before this, and it started just going viral. And I'm just like, and I'm not chasing the numbers, but it's also like a reminder of, like, if God wants something to happen, it's going to happen. Like, you can't really, you know, do that. But you also need to trust that it's not about that, you know, like. I don't care about like what people are doing and like or what, people are, what people are seeing. I just care that they can feel encouraged or inspired in some way. And so that's kind of what I, what I, why I do it at the end of the day. And yeah, if he wants to do something with that cool, if it doesn't resonate with anybody, at least I know I did my part. So. I love that. I love what you just said. And something that I, it was kind of like a light bulb bump for me. It's like, wait a second. Oh my gosh. I wonder if you have, dealt with any um any uh denial of like branding opportunities or engagement chances for being heavily rooted in sharing your faith is that something you've experienced before and yeah. and if, if so how, how did you kind of remedy that yeah i definitely like I know it's not as popular to share about it like like brands are not always want to don't, don't always want to associate themselves with the faith because they feel like they'll be like you know, taking one side if people don't have a faith and they know how it is. So, but I never let that get into the way because I was like, if an opportunity is going to present itself, it's the Lord's going to make it happen. And so I actually, it's funny because once I did start sharing my faith, I started getting more opportunities in a weird way. So I got, but it was all like faith opportunities. So I worked with two movies, like two like Christian movie uh, companies. And I've done like a few different things where I was just like, had I not even like stepped forward and just was obedient to what the Lord was putting on my heart, I wouldn't have been working with the brand. And so, yes, I think I have lost probably opportunities in some regard because some people look at my page and they're like, oh, never mind. Like, I don't want to work with her. But then I also gained other ones. And so, yes, it's definitely like a hindrance. But at the end of the day, like, I mean, money is money. I'm not really trying to chase that. I just really want to use the Lord to help me with, you know, just sharing his word. And if that brings opportunities, cool. But at the end of the day, that's that's not the true root of why I do it. So. Mm -hmm. So. A couple more things. And I, once again, I wanted to drive home the fact that I'm so appreciative of your time 
And I hope that you've enjoyed the conversation. I have. Uh, this, it's been great. I, I feel like it has, has been tremendously fruitful. And there are a couple more directions I would like to go, if that's okay with you. Mm-hmm. The, the first thing I was thinking is that um, one of the things that you've been outward about is your marriage, actually. And so I wanted to ask in that is like, how have you seen your marriage and the, because what you just talked about was purpose. And I think it, within the concept and construct of a marriage, there is mm-hmm. tremendous purpose and that's to be equally yoked and to be pointed to the cross. Yeah. Um, what are some of the ways that you've seen your marriage impact your career and things that are happening in your life on a personal level? Yeah, that's a really good question. My husband is great. He he definitely, he adds a lot to my life. I hopefully do the same for him. But I think um, the whole testimony of how we even met is part of something that I think is a, a God thing because we actually met uh, during the injury I told you about. So uh, during that season, I was following God and I was asking him like, hey, I don't know what to do right now. I'm feeling really sad. I can't practice. I can't compete. I can't travel. Anything, everything feels like it's kind of off. I just felt a real sense of him saying, start going to like young adult Christian groups. And at at first I was doing it just to make friends because even all my friends like were like in college and we all had graduated and I didn't really know anybody. So I'm like, okay, I'll I'll just start doing this to obviously have community, but also just grow my faith. So I started doing that, not with the real intention of not trying to meet like another guy, but I was just trying to go out there for myself out there to just be friendly with people and honestly get out of my head because all I was doing was focusing on running. Um, And then once I started doing that, during that season is literally when I met my husband, John. And so it just reminded me of like the reason I truly think one God allowed such a difficult moment in my life to happen is for us to be in that, that meet, that area to meet, because had I been traveling, had I been doing everything I had planned on doing, I literally would never met him. And so I think it's really cool that he did places in the way he did. Cause it's a reminder of like, our marriage is bigger than my, my career. Our marriage is bigger than sport. And at the end of the day, this is what's going to be, I'm going to have this marriage lifelong. That's obviously the goal um and track track ends like we talked about like I mean like I'm aging I'm getting closer to 30 and people are probably done mid-30s like towards that time and so having him has been such a good support and he's been truly on board with my career but he also mellows me out so he reminds me of why I'm doing it and it's really cool because in times of like despair or sadness during a meet that didn't go well or another problem happening with my knee or something he reminds me of God's word and that's just such a testament to being equally yoked and he does remind me of like why we're doing this and it's not about track and it's not about this world. Like just having that person to kind of keep you rooted and grounded in the truth is really, really helpful. And so like not only did God bring him in a season that showed me like God is working, but he also brought me in with somebody who could use, you know, have a different perspective because he's not even an athlete, which I think has been helpful. So um, yeah, I think just our marriage is the true testament of what life can look like um being married to somebody who doesn't do what you do but like having that perspective of we're still in this together we still share the same faith and we can still grow even though we don't actually do the same exact job so that's been that's been really good so if you don't mind me asking where is home for you guys we live in arkansas right now Fayetteville, arkansas okay absolutely i that kind of i i wanted to mention brings um, a couple of the like uh practice posts that i've seen of yours Kind of brings it all together for me because mm-hmm. I knew I saw that uh, Razorback logo. So yeah, we'll yeah, we, we lived in Michigan. Yeah, we used to live in Michigan. Moved um, in 2021, the end of 2021 for my training for opportunities here. That was the biggest thing. So that's another reason he's been great because he's been truly supportive. Like he left the job he was at in Michigan to come here with me. Um, he had a different one now, but yeah. So it's been it's been it's been really cool. What are what are some of the next? Because I, once again, you you brought up the concept of of being at uh, a threshold and uh, working towards the and finish line, so to say, of a career. What mm-hmm. are some of the next steps that that you've seen and maybe even you've talked about within your marriage, within your family, and moving forward as track is more so wrapping up in the next however long. Yeah, so, I mean, I'm going to do my best to hopefully run as well as possible with however left I have long. Um, And then, I mean, the sky's the limit. I went to school for education, so I have a degree in that. Um, I don't know I'm necessarily going to use it because one of my goals is to, um, to continue to work on this content creation thing, but also to 
start my own business, whatever that looks like, whether that's through fitness still, I still kind of want to be involved through wellness and fitness just because I feel it's such a strong calling to it, but also doing it in such a way where I can teach it, teach it to other people. So I'm still trying to figure out what that looks like just so I can incorporate that education background with the sport background I have now. Um, and so, yeah, that's kind of the plan. He, my husband's an engineer. So we both have, I think it's really cool because we have different like perspectives, of, perspectives of things. But for instance, now he's made me some technical stuff that I can use in my training. And so he has a lot of opportunity there with what he can do. And yeah, hopefully have kids at some point and raise them in the faith as well. And um, that's kind of just like the near 10 year goal is like trying to try to build things from what, what we're doing now and then take that into the next step of life or next phase. You know, I'm very glad that you mentioned uh, the concept of kids in the future, because mm -hmm. one of the things that I um, know to be true is that you hold the title of aunt. And mm -hmm. so being that I actually am, am an uncle as well, and I've been thinking about what are some of the ways that I can witness to my two nephews and that I can kind of play that role in their life. So I was wondering, like, what has that opportunity to be an aunt meant to you? And what are some of the learnings uh, filling that role that you've had? Yeah, that's a great question. I love my nieces and nephews. Um, yeah, it's been really cool. I mean, I have my brother has three kids. My other brother has three kids. My sister has two kids. So I have a lot of them. Um, and so, you know, just seeing them all grow up and seeing how they're raising them has been really cool. But it's been really cool to just like be the aunts whenever I come over to like play with them or talk to them or just like use little experiences of like they might do something that might not be right and be like, hey, like we should do it this way or just giving like little like life tips as I, as you can call it of uh just what they should be doing but I know I'm not their parent but I do think as an aunt you can have that that impact in that role as well of like hey like you know I'm, I'm still your senior I can still encourage you and still help you help help you grow so that's been cool and I just love to see them flourish I don't live in the same state as any of my nieces and nephews at, at the moment so that's a bit difficult but whenever I do see my sister she lives in Kansas which is three hours from me um, we connect. My niece's my niece still remind, remembers me. My nephew's only one, so he doesn't really know who I am yet. But he kind of still, you know, he's growing. So it's been fun, and um, yeah, I've learned it's a lot of work though. So I'm preparing for that because I see how my siblings are dealing with their children. I'm like, wow, this is a full time job. So mm. <laughs> definitely something I'm going to prepare for when I'm doing track because uh, that's another thing. Like, there's a lot of athletes who have kids that come back to the sport, and my sister actually did that for just one year during the 2021 Olympics, and it's been there's so much praise to her because that's hard that's really hard to do so yeah children are a lot of work but one day hopefully i'll have them and uh learn the lessons i'm, I'm learning now with the nieces and nephews i have mm, absolutely absolutely well the last thing i want to do is take up more of your time because i've been so fortunate and, and thankful to have as much time sitting here with you as i have yeah. but um one of the the last things that i was curious about is and I'm going to be really straightforward with this one. So I just wanted to acknowledge that mm -hmm. is a positive and a successful Olympic cycle in 2024 looks like what for you? That's a great question. I feel like you've had really good questions today. <laughs> uh, a successful Olympic Games in 2024 for me would be running fearless, uh, enjoying the process because I tend to get too caught up sometimes like I get just so worked up right around championships so I'm trying to really enjoy this this time around um and just truly glorify God through my gifts I think obviously I want to go out there I want to win everybody wants to go to the Olympics and win right but at the end of the day like what's the best way of glorifying God is that's my number one goal I want to make his word manifest through my performances I want people to see God when they see me and I just I just want to like, I just want to do well because I know that he's given me this opportunity. So I think that's the biggest thing is like li really living up to that and not putting too much pressure on myself. So definitely going to go for gold, but at the same time, I'm going to go for my eternal goal, which is working for God. So mm, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And lastly, Cindy, before we, before we jump off, I, I wanted to ask is, is there anything or anyone that you'd like to shout out? Uh, before we dive out? Um, I would say God, I'm shouting him out because he's great. <laughs> uh, I think just my support system. So everybody that's really got me to this point, my coaches, um, my sister and brother-in-law, my brother-in-law is my sister's husband. And he's just been, he was my coach at one point. He was also somebody who told me like not to quit during the time I was struggling. So 
he just has been such a pivotal part, part in my process and my husband. I mean, I think he's been super, super helpful as well. Just the past few years and supportive. And then you guys, I think what you're doing and just helping other people hear the word through what your podcast is truly doing, I think is super encouraging. And yeah, I just love what you, I love how, I love seeing other people share God's truth. So thank you for doing that. Well, thank you. Thank you. And I can say confidently that you've gained a lifelong fan. And I certainly will be uh, having the the TV on and watching what's happening over uh, in France in just a short amount of time. So, thank you. I really appreciate that, Brian. Absolutely. And thank you for, for being here. And um, thank you because I feel like for, for me, uh, you know, this is something like my goal is to be in my career mm-hmm. is to be renowned as somebody who was one of the better, more poignant interviewers of all time. That's that's kind of my lofty expectation. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I am so grateful and blessed that I am able to speak to someone such as you with the platform you have and who you are uh, now that I've gotten to truly learn and unpack more of that. And I just wanted to say that uh, one of the things at Michigan State I've been aiming to do is break down the barriers between media members and athletes um, in the collegiate realm. And Mm -hmm. I think that's worked. And I've been proud of that. But yeah. I was unsure of how uh, this would go and how our interactions would go. And I've been nothing but pleasantly surprised by connecting with you. So thank you. Good. Me too. No, it's been, it's been really fun. I'm very happy I could do this. <laughs> well, folks, with that, it's been season three, episode one of Confluence World podcast. And really, I couldn't think of a better way to begin season three being that it's the summertime and things are hot and getting ready to go over in Paris, France, you can connect with Miss Sember in many different ways on many platforms as we have discussed. And with that, we'll, uh, we'll leave it right there, but thank you for tuning in. And um, if you didn't make it to the finish line, we can say confidently that, um, uh, we, we hope you will continue to think about these things and, and implement some of these teachings and um, principles into whatever you are doing. So thank you, everyone, for, for being here and um, very much appreciate it.